Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Horror Mine. My name is Vic Shai, and this is The Scare Score, where I break down horror movies and rate them on how scary I think they are. I am finally continuing my coverage of the Ringu franchise after having covered Ringu 2 10 months ago. Yikes. In this episode, I'll be going over the prequel film of the series, Ringu Zero Birthday. The film tells the story of Sadako Yamamura and the events that led to the creation of the cursed videotape. Sort of. I'll be going over the events that take place throughout the film as our scare score goes up or down based on how effective the scares are or attempt to be. The first two Ringu films are absolute classics of the Japanese horror genre and Ringu Zero Birthday aims to give one of the most iconic horror movie villains a fitting backstory. But how scary is it? Sit back and relax and join me as we explore Ringu Zero Birthday and tally up the scare score. Our movie begins in quite literally the least scary manner possible. The credits appear on screen accompanied by a puzzling song choice. I couldn't believe what my ears were hearing. I suppose they wanted to try something new and hip going into the new millennium, but still, the first two Ringu films were terrifying classics of the Japanese horror genre. The very second this movie started, I knew it was in trouble. A young girl is sitting in a crowded street speaking with her friend on the phone about the cursed video. She mentions a dream she had the previous night about an old well. She describes her dream sequence in a decently creepy scene that should have just been the opening of the film without all the crazy music. She sees Sadako's well in her dream and wanders into an old and creepy house. She then witnesses the murder of Sadako Yamamura by her father, Dr. Heihachiro Ikuma. <gasps> We are transported 30 years in the past and meet a journalist named Miyagi who was doing a story on Sadako. She speaks to one of Sadako's old teachers named Mrs. Sudo who taught Sadako 11 years ago. She describes Sadako as a very pretty and intelligent girl who was terribly afraid of the sea. On one of her field trips to the beach, Sadako refused to get into the water with her fellow students claiming that they would die if they went swimming. All 14 of her classmates tragically drowned just like Sadako predicted. We are then introduced to Sadako herself who is very beautiful indeed and portrayed by Japanese actress Yuki Nakama. Sadako is sitting alone in her room while looking at a picture of her late mother, Shizuko Yamamura. Sadako is part of a theater company rehearsing for one of their upcoming plays. Sadako is the typical outcast character and treated poorly by the other cast members, especially the main actress of the play, a woman named Aiko. Sadako is plagued by the ability to see dead people and sees a doctor named named Kuno, who's been prescribing her medication. She says that she's felt better ever since joining the theater group. I can relate to that as I was in theater during high school and absolutely loved it. Aiko says she's been feeling weird ever since Sadako arrived. She says that there is always something behind her along with a well. She describes having a reoccurring dream like the one seen in the beginning of the film and the lady next to her says she's been experiencing the exact same thing. Their conversation is overheard by the costume designer named Etsuko. During a rehearsal, Aiko sees a strange little girl walking across the stage that no one else seems to notice. At the same time, sound technician Toyama hears a strange noise coming from his equipment. Aiko is mysteriously found dead soon after. This was a decently creepy scene that adds a somewhat interesting dynamic to a pretty boring story so far. Journalist Miyagi speaks to a doctor about the experiment performed by Dr. Ikuma where a man mysteriously dropped dead. Big two. Big two. She replays the audio from the incident and we hear the same screeching noise heard during the theater rehearsal before Aiko's death. The experiment occurred 12 years ago and all the reporters present in that room have since passed away. She is looking for the locations of Dr. Ikuma and Sadako so she could make sense of what's been going on. Back at the theater, the death of Aiko has sent shockwaves throughout the group who are all wondering if the production will go on. The director named Shigemori says that the show must go on. He is hoping for a comeback strong stronger than when Squidward and his band successfully performed at the Bubble Bowl. Never 
he drops the huge bomb that Sadako will take the lead role from Aiko. This is a role that she's been wanting as she was rehearsing the lines earlier in the film. Most of the company is surprised that she's been picked for the role and don't sound like they approve. Toyama tries comforting Sadako, which makes his girlfriend Etsuko jealous, and we now have a much-needed love triangle to add to this wonderful plot. Sadako does a great job at her first rehearsal, which wows Toyama and the director. Toyama tries speaking with Sadako backstage, and she witnesses Aiko's ghost pointing at her. Aiko blames Sadako for her death, but she says that it wasn't her fault. The director speaks to Sadako about her lines and places his arm around her shoulder, which obviously makes Toyama jealous. Toyama reviews the audio from the rehearsal and shows Etsuko the strange noise heard before Aiko's death. They hear the words, you will die, coming from the audio. Ooh, spooky and ominous. Director Shigemori visits Sadako at her apartment and promises to make her a star. Two girls try and instigate a little bit of drama by telling Etsuko to watch out for Sadako and Toyama. While altering Sadako's dress, a little girl wearing white walks right behind her. The little girl is the young version of Sadako. She briefly sees the well before waking up from the nightmare. She and Toyama find Sadako alone on stage. Etsuko gets mad at Sadako for taking the dress, but Toyama defends her. Sadako says that she sometimes does things that she doesn't remember, like taking the dress. She says that she doesn't remember what happened when the director came to her apartment, possibly hinting that he did something bad to her. Sadako says that there is always someone with her that terrifies her from her childhood. She remembers the incident where her classmates died at sea and we briefly see the man with the towel over his head from the cursed video. She wakes up inside Toyama's apartment who says that she fainted the previous day. She seems happy for a second before seeing blood on his hands and runs out of his apartment. Etsuko becomes curious about Sadako and begins investigating her. She notices that her resume doesn't appear to have a picture like everyone else. She speaks with Sadako's therapist, hoping to get some information about her, but he's not about to violate doctor-patient confidentiality. A mysterious man appears and picks up one of the flyers from the play that Etsuko conveniently dropped on the ground. Back at the theater, Sadako and Toyama share a sweet look before Shigemori enters the stage. Etsuko tells Toyama to stay away from Sadako, believing that she is hiding something. The mysterious man from earlier works with journalist Miyagi, who finds the theater in Sadako's location. She briefly locks eyes with Sadako and clearly has a personal grudge against her. They confront Sadako on stage and begin taking pictures, making her uncomfortable. The movie then dramatically focuses on director Shigemori for some reason. Miyagi returns to her office where she is met by Sadako's old teacher, Mrs. Sudo. We see a flashback where Mrs. Sudo visited young Sadako at the Yamamura Inn. She comes across Sadako's mother, Shizuko, in the mirror looking as creepy as she did in the first film. Shizuko Yamamura will never fail to be absolutely creepy. Her facial expressions make me super uncomfortable and give me chills every time. Actress Masako, who portrays Shizuko, does an excellent job playing the character. Shizuko Yamamura has been the only consistently scary thing about the franchise so far, and I'd even argue that she is scarier than Sadako herself. Mrs. Sudo hears a crawling sound coming from the attic and sees long black hair and a creepy eye staring at her. She turns around to see young Sadako behind her and admits that she's always been afraid of her. I've always been afraid. <laughs> Based on the flashback and some of the things Sadako has said herself, it sounds as if she may have a dual personality. The photographer develops the photos and we see what appears to be the shadow of a young Sadako standing directly behind regular Sadako. The photos of the rest of the cast and crew all seem distorted, which leads Miyagi to believe that they are all cursed. She takes a closer look at Sadako's photo and realizes that there is a second Sadako following her around. Before she leaves, she thanks the photographer for everything. He's only spoken a couple of lines and taken a few photos, so that line felt a little forced and out of place. Doyama eavesdrops on a conversation between Sadako and the director. Shigemori provokes Sadako and accuses her of killing Aiko for the lead role in the play. His motive is unclear and his actions throughout the film are confusing. At first, it seems like he had a crush on Sadako and wanted to use his position as director to take advantage of her. He now believes that Sadako is responsible for killing Aiko and the reporter from years ago and threatens to tell everyone her 
supposed secret if she tries to kill him. Several props and equipment on stage begin moving on their own, and the director begins choking her for some reason. Toyama pulls him off of her, and a full-on brawl ensues. Sadako hears a little girl's laughter coming from above her, and yells at young Sadako to stay away from her. The brawl ends in director Shigemori's off-screen death, and Toyama has a hilariously delayed reaction to getting smacked on the head 30 seconds earlier. <gasps> Sadako takes him to Dr. Kuno, but his wound has magically started to heal on its own. Sadako looks at her hands and realizes that she's a white lighter. The film is going in all sorts of crazy directions now. Miyagi looks at a photo of her and her late husband, who turns out to be the journalist who died during the Dr. Ikuma presentation. She believes Sadako is responsible for his death and plans to kill Sadako for revenge. She calls Etsuko to aid her in her quest for vengeance. Sadako and Toyama almost share a kiss, but he falls asleep right before the smooch. The next day, he witnesses Sadako miraculously healing a man and giving him the ability to walk again. I'm not a huge fan of the story and how it's been presented so far, but I do think that this aspect of Sadako is actually pretty cool. They return to the theater and attempt to hide the director's body, although I'm sure if they called the authorities as soon as it happened that they might be okay. The director attacked them both and Toyama was only defending himself and Sadako. The opening night of the play has arrived and the crew take notice of the director's absence. They decide that the show must go on but are very suspicious of Sadako who isn't helping her case with her body language. Toyama has the brilliant plan to escape after the play is over. In a very sweet scene, he calls Sadako beautiful. Her reaction makes it seem like it's the first time anyone's ever called her that, which is very sweet and sad at the same time. They share a beautiful moment together and profess their love for one another. The nurse tells Dr. Kuno that Sadako healed the old man and he rushes out to Sadako's play. Miyagi meets with Etsuko before the play and hands her an envelope. The play has a full house and the stage is fully set for sabotage. During the play, one of the technicians notices dried blood on the floor and discovers the director's dead body. I suppose he was on a time crunch, but Toyama could have done a much better job in hiding the dead body. He notifies the rest of the crew and they immediately blame Sadako. Etsuko enters the sound box and lies to Toyama to make him leave. Sadako appears on stage and it's her time to shine. Etsuko plays the recording of the Dr. Ikuma incident on the speakers, leaving Sadako and the audience in confusion. Take two. Take two. Take two. This triggers Sadako and the stage lights begin to flicker. Toyama heads back to the sound box and for someone who supposedly loves her, doesn't try all that hard to stop what's happening. Shizuko briefly appears on stage and says something inaudible to Sadako before disappearing into the darkness. Again, Shizuko is always creepy and the way she cha-cha slides her way everywhere makes her even scarier. The spirit of Miyagi's husband appears in front of Sadako and points, calling her a freak. The screeching noise comes on the speakers and makes everyone in the audience question why they paid 800 yen for. Dr. Kuno comes on stage and tries to console Sadako. He tries to calm her down but is unsuccessful. <coughs> They add a little pizzazz to his death as he falls right on top of the bed of candles. The audience realizes that this isn't scripted and scatter faster than when King Kong broke out of his chains. Miyagi's sabotage has gone according to plan and she sees young Sadako standing over Dr. Kuno's dead body. The cast and crew have seen enough and start chasing after Sadako. Toyama is unable to stop them and they corner her in the dressing room. One of the guys pulls a jack torrent and says that they aren't going to hurt her as they approach her with weapons and menacing looks. The table behind them shakes on its own and all the mirrors in the room suddenly break. Sadako pleads with them that this isn't her, but they proceed to brutally beat her to death. Toyama cries over her dead body and Miyagi walks in to see that her job's already been done. They took our job! Miyagi says that killing Sadako wasn't enough and that this isn't over. They've all had the dream about the well, meaning they are cursed. They need to get rid of the second Sadako for the curse to be gone. She finds a letter from Dr. Ikuma behind the photo of Shizuko, which 
leads them to his whereabouts. Doyama tags along with the troop and mourns over his dead lover. The mob arrives at Dr. Ikuma's house where the iconic well is also located. Dr. Ikuma greets them at the door and knows that they've arrived to kill Sadako. He explains that there was only one Sadako at first, but they eventually split into two people. One took after Shizuko and one took after their real father, who is still unknown but is believed to be some type of demon from the sea. The Sadako from this film turned out to be good and gained powers of healing. The other Sadako was malevolent and Dr. Ikuma used drugs on her to stop her from growing, which is why she still appears like a little girl. Miyagi heads up to the attic, locked and loaded, to kill the other Sadako. The room is empty aside from a television playing static. Back in the truck, Sadako magically comes back to life. Toyama tries taking her away and the mob goes chasing after them. The smaller Sadako asks Toyama a question through bigger Sadako's body which scares him a little. She tells him to leave her, but he refuses to leave her side. She walks to the edge of a cliff, and we see her other half standing between the trees. Sadako says she can't go on anymore, and we see hands wrapped around her waist. The film zooms into her eye, where we see images of the sea, Shizuko, and Sadako's other half. Sadako's hair covers her face, and she seemingly merges with her other half, becoming the Sadako Yamamura that we know and love. It seems Dr. Ikuma was purposely keeping the two Sadakos away from each other to avoid them merging into this powerful entity. Toyama seems to have a fetish for creepy Japanese ghost women because he has a huge smile on his face now. He tells Sadako that he loves her before his scream can be heard throughout the forest. The wind blows ominously and the mob realize that they're now in danger. Sadako is now stalking them and is seen walking through the trees. They all start to drop dead one by one and Miyagi and Etsuko take off running. Etsuko drops to her knees and annoyingly begins to cry and it's agonizing. <laughs> Dr. Ikuma runs out into the woods and pleads with Sadako to stop the killing. They retreat into a house and Sadako is standing right outside menacingly. She teleports into the house and now looks very similar to how she did in the first film. Sadako slowly approaches them while creepily contorting her body. We hear two off-screen gunshots and Dr. Ikuma comes running in. He discovers their dead bodies with gunshot wounds as Miyagi killed Etsuko and took her own life to prevent Sadako from killing them. He sees Sadako crying in the next room, having reverted to her normal self. He takes her back home and injects her with something that he says is going to calm her. She asks him who her real father is and he says, I am the father. It turns out that he injected her with poison and plans to end it all. Sadako tries running away and he chases after her, pleading her to forgive him. She crawls towards the well and we witness the infamous moment that started the entire curse. She pleads with him to spare her, but he smacks her in the head with a blade and tosses her body into the well. Hearing her plead for her life and her screams as she falls into the well is simply tragic. Dr. Iguma cries and seems remorseful for what he feels he had to do, making him appear a bit more sympathetic than the previous entries. Sadako wakes up in Toyama's apartment and he tells her that it was all just a dream. She reaches out to touch him, but in reality, she is trapped in the well. Toyama-san. I've been feeling bad for Sadako throughout the film, but when she reached out to Toyama to touch his face and felt the rocks, I felt horrible. In the film's final scene, she calls out to her lover in tears. She cries out in anguish as the lid to the well closes, leaving her in complete darkness as the movie ends. <laughs> And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Ringu Zero Birthday. My friends, this was a messy prequel that did not do the previous two movies justice. There is a lot to complain about here, but I'm not a movie critic, so I'll keep it short and simple. The movie was simply not scary. I understand that the objective of the film was to give Sadako a sympathetic backstory. However, the movie played out much more like a dramatic romance than a horror film. There were some aspects of the story that I appreciated, but the movie took way too long to 
get going and felt pretty boring at times. Though I will say that Sadako herself was very well portrayed and I truly did feel bad for her character. Sure, there were a few scares spread throughout, but I really mean a few. The few scares that the film did manage to show were rehashed from the first two films and nothing original really stood out as scary, earning Ringu Zero Birthday a disappointing scare score of 38%. The scariest scene in the film was when Mrs. Sudo came across Shizuko in the flashback. I always get chills when I see Shizuko and this time was no different. Her gaze is truly menacing and disturbing and she is one of the scariest things about the entire franchise. But as always, I hope y'all enjoyed this video. Thank you all for tuning in and I cannot wait to see y'all right back here in the Horror Mine. Y'all stick around.